So thank you for joining uh, me today for the health insurance in your senior years, Medicare and other options. I'm Maria Papitas. I work with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. And I'm really pleased to be with you today to, to kind of provide an overview of um, Medicare and uh, some of those wraparound policies uh, um, as it, uh, uh, and some of the things to consider when you're when you're approaching Medicare uh, time and are thinking about <clears throat> some of those wraparound policies. So I want to begin today um, with a request. Uh, so will you help us? Um, we are doing a pre and a post survey. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, to help us improve the program. And uh, in the chat is the URL that will take you to the Qualtrics survey. We would really love for your uh, input into this. Uh, we are still in the pilot stage of this program and are trying to get um, another 20 or so uh, uh, survey results to help us meet our our, our total. Of course, uh, this is a research study regarding the, the workshop that we're attending, uh, that we're presenting today. And we, um, uh, any information will be held confidentially. You can certainly continue to, to participate in this uh, workshop, even if you decide not to fill out that survey, but we would really love that if you would. So just take a, a few moments and um, please fill that out. And like yesterday, when you're back, please uh, give me a, a heads up in the chat that you're back and ready to continue. <clears throat> to just cover kind of our plan for today and uh, First and fo foremost, we were going to cover to help you information to help you understand what you need to know about healthcare costs in your senior years. We'll be uh, talking about where to go for information about Medicare and supplemental health insurance uh, policies and options. <clears throat> We're going to review some strategies and use some tools to help you estimate what your healthcare costs will be. And lastly, we'll identify what options uh, there are within these plans to cover long-term health care healthcare costs. So we have some key questions that we need to answer. The why. Why do I need to plan for health care after age 65? The what? What's Medicare? What does it cover? What are my other health insurance options? And what documents provide some of that information? And finally, <clears throat> how do I estimate my health care costs? And how do I cover long-term care? And of course, once we have these questions answered, you'll be able to choose and use your um, Medicare and other policies effectively. So let's start with the why. Why do I need to plan for healthcare after age 65? So this is an opportunity for you to share your ideas about why it's so important to have healthcare uh, and plan for health care after the age of 65. So in the chat, just take a few minutes, share your thoughts about what those reasons might be. Now I know some of you have ideas about why it'd be so important to have health care, to plan for health care after 65. <clears throat> well, here are some of the reasons that we came up with, right? So um, primarily, right, to ensure you have coverage as you, as you, that you need as you age. <clears throat> when you turn 65, you really need to make some decisions about health care. And for many people, Medicare becomes your primary insurance and you have a seven month window to, to sign up, right? Three months before your, the birth month, your birth month and the three months after. 
Uh, if you're offered insurance through your employer, it, uh, it the employer service insurance usually becomes your secondary or supplemental policy. And the other reason is, you know, as we age, we tend to need access to additional health care. So it's not uh, only required, but it also really is um, for your benefit. Another reason is to gain the most benefit from your insurance coverage. And so having insurance ensures that you have health benefits and access to preventative services like your annual check checkup. And because health insurance providers have negotiated rates with healthcare service providers, you'll, you'll pay less, right? So it's really important to understand the plan and get the most benefit out of your coverage. <clears throat> Determining the total out-of-pocket costs of the health insurance plans are important. Um, health care costs are a major portion of a family uh, a spending plan. And it's estimated that um, after the age of 65, total health care costs per person are about 130 to $150,000 from age 65 forward. Now that includes premiums uh, and other out-of-pocket costs. But if you think about that from a couple's perspective, that's close to $300,000. So it's important to understand what those out-of-pocket costs are. And the, then of course, saving, right? Saving for those out-of-pocket costs that are going to include things like the deductible and the co-insurance and the co-payments um, and, and all of those other uh, services that we, that we need. <clears throat> and then uh, not so much about Medicare, but in terms of those supplemental policies, you're going to want to be sure that they fit your needs, right? Both your health needs as well as your financial, your financial needs. And so for all of these reasons, understanding and reviewing costs and understanding um, you know why you need to plan for health care after age, age 65 is so important. So our next question is what is Medicare and what does it cover? Well Medicare is a national health insurance program in the United States. It began around 1966 under the Social Security Administration and is now administered by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS. It provides health insurance for Americans age 65 and older but also younger people with a disability status and that's determined by the Social Security Administration. People qualify for Medicare coverage and Medicare Part A premiums um, are, are, are waived for those people who qualify. And so what does qualification mean? Well, if you're 65 years or older, a U.S. citizen, uh, or have been um, a permanent legal resident for five continuous years, they and their spouse or maybe even their ex-spouse, uh, who have paid for Medicare taxes for at least 10 years, right? So all of those pieces uh, would warrant qualification or eligibility for Medicare. If you are under 65 and disabled and have been receiving SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance benefits, or Railroad Retirement Board Disability benefits, uh, you would also qualify. Um, so you have to receive one of these benefits for at least 24 months from the date of entitlement before becoming eligible to enroll in Medicare. Um, and then the last qualification or eligibility would be if you're getting a continual dialysis for end stage renal disease or need a kidney transplant. So those are the three major um, ways in which people can become eligible. <clears throat> and as I said before, enrollment for Part A, Medicare Part A, and we'll talk about what that is in a minute, must occur during the three months before and the three months after the month you turn 65. And so during this seven month period, there are no penalties uh, for um, signing up uh, late. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes too.
So Medicare really helps to reduce the cost for seniors um, and those with disabilities, uh, but there are costs associated with the program. And so we're gonna take a look at the parts of the program and some of the costs associated with them. So there are four parts of Medicare, part A, B, C, and D. And this gets a little confusing, but hopefully today we're gonna kind of clear those things up. So part A is uh, really about hospitalization. And so it covers things like inpatient, uh, hospital stays, home health care and skilled nursing uh, facility care kinds of visits. So think like in hospital, right? Um, but also in home when you would be receiving care, um, you know, medical care. Part B is really the outpatient um, part of Medicare. And so this covers things like doctor's visits, outpatient services, diagnostic screenings, uh, it would cover things like uh, casts or uh, equipment that um, you would need in order to be mobile. Part C offers an alternative way to receive Medicare benefits. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But uh, Medicare uh, is also called the Medicare Advantage plans, and they are offered through private health insurance companies. And so when you join a Medicare Advantage plan, you have Medicare, um, but the difference is that the plan covers and pays for your services instead of the original Medicare um, or organization. So these plans must provide the same coverage as original Medicare, and by original Medicare, they mean Part A, B, and D combined, right? Um, and so you're not really missing out on anything. Um, but the advantage to these plans is they sometimes offer extra benefits like vision or dental, uh, depending on the plan. And options for Part C are gonna vary depending on where you live. All right, how about Part D? So Part D, I just kind of think of it as D for drugs, right? Uh, Part D provides the prescription drug uh, uh, coverage. And these, again, are offered through private plans. So we're gonna take a closer look uh, at this um, by watching this video. And uh, this was a video developed by uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And um, it gives a nice overview. So we're gonna watch this now. Hi, I'm Angela James at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Did you know that you can choose how you get your Medicare coverage? Today we're going to talk about the differences between Original Medicare, Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plans, and Medicare Supplement Insurance Policies, which are also known as Medigap Policies. When you're eligible for Medicare, the first thing to consider is whether you want to get your coverage through Original Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan like an HMO or PPO. Both Original Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans have both Part A and Part B coverage. Part A covers inpatient hospital stays, care in a skilled nursing facility, hospice care, and some home health care. Part A is free for most people. Now Part B covers certain doctor services, outpatient care, medical supplies, and preventive services. There's a monthly premium for Part B. Now even though both Original Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans cover Part A and Part B services, there are some differences that I want to help you understand. <coughs> Original Medicare is provided directly through Medicare, and you have your choice of doctors, hospitals, and other providers that accept Medicare. Original Medicare covers about 80% of your health care costs. Generally, you or any supplemental coverage that you have pays deductibles and coinsurance, and you usually pay a monthly Part B premium. Now, Medicare Advantage plans, also called Part C, provide coverage through private insurance companies that are approved by Medicare. In most plans, you need to use doctors, hospitals, and other providers that are in your plan's provider network. 
If you decide to use a provider outside of your plan's provider network, you may have to pay more or pay all of the costs. And there are usually co-payments or co-insurance for covered services, and you may pay a monthly premium in addition to your Part B premium. Now each plan has different costs and rules, and some can have extra coverage like vision or dental. Now I want to tell you about Medicare <coughs> prescription drug plans, also <coughs> called Part D. These are plans that add drug coverage to Medicare. These plans are run by private insurance companies that are approved by Medicare. To add this coverage, you usually pay a monthly premium. If you have a Medicare Advantage plan that offers drug coverage, you may have to get that drug coverage through your Medicare Advantage plan. Otherwise, <coughs> you can join a Medicare prescription drug plan. So do you remember how I told you that Medicare pays about 80% of your health care costs? Well, Medicare Supplemental Insurance Policies, or Medigap, is coverage that's offered through private companies to fill in the gaps in original Medicare. With a Medigap plan, you pay a monthly premium in addition to your Part B premium, and the cost for that premium can vary between policies and companies. You may also be able to get similar coverage through an employer or a union. It's important that you realize Medigap policies don't work with Medicare Advantage plans. In fact, if you already have a Medicare Advantage plan, it's illegal for someone to sell you a Medigap policy. Now these are just the basics. To get more information about your Medicare choices, visit Medicare.gov. And you can also check out some of our other videos on this YouTube channel to learn more. And this is the first of our handouts. Uh, and so this speaks to a little bit about what does uh, Medicare cover? And uh, so this handout Maria, you did is get a couple your of Medicare at a glance handout and um, also outline some of the costs associated with Medicare. So you can see Part A. So remember, Part A has to do with uh, the hospitalization. As you can see from this chart, most people don't pay a premium for Part A, uh, unless, of course, you haven't paid Medicare taxes as part of your um, employment. And so as you kind of read that first uh, chart of uh, row there you talk you that it kind of spells out if you if you buy part a um, if you have to buy part a because you haven't paid into uh, for medicare taxes then it would be 458 dollars each month in 2020. if you paid medicare taxes for less than 30 quarters uh, the standard part a premium um, is that $458. And if you paid Medicare taxes for 30 to 39 quarters, the standard would be a 252. So um, the, the, the good part of this is, is if you haven't uh, paid into the system, you still have access to Medicare. It's just going to cost you some more. Now, the other thing that's different uh, too here if for Part A is there is a deductible and coinsurance. And so you can see here that uh, there is a 1,408 deductible for each benefit period. Now, this is a little bit different than what we think of as a deductible for our healthcare policies like through um, through the marketplace or maybe th even through our employer because typically in those plans i'm going to call them the under age 65 plans you know we have an annual deductible and once we meet that we're done what's different about medicare is that figure is uh, oftentimes a lot lower but <clears throat> it's for a benefit period. So what does that mean? So a benefit period has to do with that period of illness. So for example, let's say um, I go into the hospital because I have uh, a broken leg and um, I would have to pay that $1,400 uh, deductible for that period of time that I am in the hospital um, and getting cared for for that broken leg. Well, let's say six months later, something else happens. Um, maybe I, um, I don't know, have an upper respiratory issue or a cardiac issue, and I go to the hospital and I um, am admitted, then again, I would have 
another $1,400 uh, deductible to pay. So you can see that depending on how ill you are or the kinds of things that happen to you over the year, you may have um, more than one deductible uh, to pay in a year. There are also co-insurance um, costs. And so you can see the breakdown there based on the days and that is the days that you're in the hospital. So for your first uh, 60 days, um, it would be a zero co-insurance for each benefit period. Uh, for days 61 to 90, there's a co-insurance of 352 per day. For days 91 and beyond, 704 uh, per day. And, um, uh, and that, uh, After that 90 day period, it, period, there are some lifetime days that you can kind of use, um, but beyond lifetime reserve days, um, the, you're responsible for all of the costs. So you can see how hospitalization could get very expensive very quickly. Okay, what about the Part B premium? Well, this is the standard premium um, that typically we think of when we are talking about a premium for Medicare. And this year for 2020, it's $144.60. Maybe higher depending on your income. Uh, last year, 2019, they instituted a deductible. There used to be no deductible per Part B, but this year there is a deductible of $198. But after you've met this deductible, um, you would be paying approximately 20% of those costs associated with all of those, I'll call them outpatient services. For Part C, there is a monthly premium and that is based on the plan that you choose. So again, in this case, you would be uh, finding a service provider for a Medicare Advantage plan. And depending on that provider, there would be, uh, there may or may not be a premium. And as it said in the video, this may be above and beyond that $144 um, Part B premium that you're paying. And then Part D is your prescription drug plan. And again, this would be um, an additional premium if, it, if you buy a just a prescription drug insurance policy. Uh, if you're, and that would be the case if you are also uh, using original Medicare Part A and Part B. The rest of that handout speaks a little bit and provides a little bit more detail about each of these different parts and um, some of the costs associated with them. And so some of the detail is a little bit about what's covered, what's not, the kinds of services that are covered, some of the, um, uh, you know, more details around uh, kind of hospice care, inpatient stay, mental health inpatient, skilled nursing facility, those kinds of things, and what are those benefit periods and the costs associated with them. It also provides a chart um, for, in terms of Part B, whether or not you would pay more than that $144.60, um, because that is sort of income-based. And again, this is sort of personal income, not necessarily family income. So, um, for example, if one person in the family makes under that $87,000 per year, kind of uh, between 87 and 174, right? Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Under, under $87,000 personally, or $174,000 $174, if you're joint, then you would pay that $144.60. As, in as the income goes up, then the premium goes up, right? So uh, again, it depends a little bit on your income, depends on how you're filing, um, but there are, um, there are uh, increases uh, depending on how much, you, how much your income is. And so there's, uh, there's you know, some more details there about Part C and Part D. And you know, one of the things that's really important to know 
uh, for our clientele that we work with is this whole idea of enrolling late and sort of permanently um, uh, having a penalty associated with the Part D plan or the Part B plan. And so many people um, uh, get confused about this. Um, one of the things that I have found is I have talked with uh, consumers, especially now, is, is um, that because the Social Security retirement, full retirement age is a little bit higher, people are assuming that the Medicare sign up is associated with Social Security full retirement age. So I, I've had several people come and talk with me about, well, I am now paying a permanent penalty because I didn't know I had to sign up for Medicare at 65. So to me, that is one of the big messages is um, whether you're working or not uh, at age 65, it's important to connect with um, the Medicare office or the Social Security office, whichever it is in your state, and uh, get yourself informed about signing up for Medicare. So speaking to this, there are some really important dates, as I mentioned, right? This three months before age 65, three months after 65. So there's sort of this initial enrollment period that's uh, uh, a seven month long window, I'll just say. Uh, other important things to know is that October 1st is when updates are made to the Medicare website about next year's uh, plans. And so we can really start comparing um, what the plans will be. And by the plans, I mean the supplemental plans. Between October 15th and December 7th, uh, typically this is when you might make any changes to your Medicare supplement or prescription drug coverage. Or if you decide, say you signed up for Medicare Advantage and now you wanna shift over to regular Medicare. <clears throat> so those are the windows to be able to do that. And then that January 1st is when, when the coverage begins. So um, Jesse has informed me that there was a question. Do you get some kind of notice to do this to sign up at 65 or is it just something that you are supposed to know? So usually you do get a notice. Um, I think some people, you know, don't pay attention to their mail, but yeah, you usually do get a noticed notice. And it looked like Susie mentioned, you know, you may not get a notice unless you're already drawing social security benefits. Becky had mentioned, are there health promotion incentive programs like what is offered with HealthQuest in Kansas to encourage <coughs> healthy living for Medicare Advantage? Susie had mentioned she's not sure. She was talking to Becky there. Great question. We don't have many Medicare Advantage plans up here. And I guess I would say, in general, it depends on the Medicare Advantage plan. Some of them offer a lot of preventative services. Some of them are um, kind of basic coverage. And by basic coverage, they may include vision and dental but uh, and prescription drug, but they may not have sort of those extras. Um, Rachel mentioned that it might, not, it might be good to note that Medicare Advantage plans do not work well in some areas in Kansas. For instance, in Southwest Kansas, most providers will be out of network and the person will end up not being covered effectively or pay a lot of out-of-pocket costs. That is great to know. Good, thank you. I knew we had experts with us today. It's been a very interesting um, couple of years. Uh, I've noticed that Medicare Advantage plans have really been pushed, um, you know, lots of advertising for them. And I know that this is, that's been a policy of this current administration to really try to um, encourage use of the Medicare Advantage uh, plans. Uh, but I think as you all have noticed and Jesse just shared, it's that idea of making sure, you know, understanding what the network really is and um, knowing what services are available. Um, I know that one of the things that um, 
my mom, uh, who is still with me, thankfully, and is on Medicare, you know, she in her younger retiree years um, traveled a lot and um, really enjoyed the fact that uh, and she had regular Medicare, so she really enjoyed the fact that she could really go anywhere uh, and um, and be covered by Medicare anywhere in the United States and be covered by Medicare. So, um, so that's also kind of a consideration in terms of you know do I do I choose a regular ordinary original Medicare versus a Medicare um, Advantage plan. So thank you, Jesse, for helping me with the chat. I don't know what's going on with my little computer here, but please let me know if there's other uh, comments too. All right, so <clears throat> a little bit more about Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage plans. Um, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, they are like HMOs or, or PPOs, right? Home uh, um, health maintenance organizations or preferred provider organizations. Um, they have to include all the benefits and services that are covered under Part A and B of the original Medicare. And um, oftentimes they include a prescription drug coverage um, or, you know, Part D is part of the plan. Again, it depends on the provider. They are run by Medicare approved private insurance companies and they have to follow all the rules and they're under the um, kind of purview and um, of, of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, they have a yearly limit on the out-of-pocket costs for medical services, so that that is a plus compared to original Medicare. And um, as I mentioned before, they often um, have extra benefits and services that aren't included in that original Medicare, but sometimes uh, for an extra cost. So that's that's kind of an, an overview of those Part uh, Part C or Medicare Advantage uh, plans. So what's my next key questions to know? Okay, so what are my other health insurance options? <clears throat> and of course, if you know this, you'll be a smart user of your health insurance. And so um, there are these uh, policies called Medigap or supplement, uh, pol supplemental policies, Medicare supplemental policies. And especially because uh, Medicare doesn't cover everything, um, these plans come into place to really wrap around and supplement those original plans, those Medicare original plans. So you may remember when we looked at that chart with the um, deductibles and the coinsurances of 20%, right? So these supplemental policies wrap around and often cover um, of the deductibles as well as the coinsurances that aren't covered by Medicare. And so these supplemental plans could be ones that you purchase, right, directly from a health insurance provider. It could be, uh, say, something that's offered to you by your employer. So I know, for example, my, at the University of Delaware, when and if I ever get to retire, um, the, my current um, uh, health insurance policy could be wrapped around, right, my Medicare policy. <clears throat> so um, what uh, there are sort of standardized plans uh, that helps us comparison shop and we're going to take a look at that in just a second and then it depends on the type of insurance plan so what I mean by that is that there are different supplemental plans out there and they um, they could be an HMO, they could be a PPO, they could be an EPO. Um, and we learned a little bit um, on day one, the differences between these plans, right? And so for example, an EPO is going to have a network that you really have to, and an HMO, right? They're gonna have a network in which you, you have to um, stay within. And obviously, it depends on the insurance company. So back in the 90s, <clears throat> 
the Center, for, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, decided um, that there were so many different crazy policies out there um, that they put some rules in place to really standardize what these plans had to include. Uh, and so this is one of the, the sec one of the second, the second handout uh, that I suggested that you pull up. And it's called How to Compare Medigap Policies. <clears throat> and so this is a snip of uh, that, that document um, for us to kind of take a look at. And so every Medigap policy has to follow federal and state laws that are designed really to protect you. And it must clearly be identified as a Medicare supplement policy. And insurance companies can only send, sell you one of these standardized policies. Um, and um, in most states, they are identified by these letters. You can see across the top of the sheet, A, B, C, D, F, G, K, L, M, right? All policies offer the same basic benefits, but some offer additional benefits. So you can choose which one meets your needs. Uh, and so each insurance company decides which Medigap policy it wants to sell, although state laws might affect which ones they can offer. Insurance companies that sell Medigap policies must offer Medigap plans A, C, and typically G. Uh, and you can see here there's a column that says F. So uh, two years ago they started phasing out policy F for those people who are um, new to purchasing Medigap policies. If in the past you had an F plan you could uh, continue that. But going forward uh, only G plans will be, well, F plans won't be um, offered. So let's just take a look at this chart <clears throat> and how, how do we read it, right? So you can see the plan letters across the top. Um, and then along the left-hand side, there's types of services that are provided. So we can look at exam an example. So uh, for we know that there is a 20% coinsurance for Part A. And so you can see for that uh, first row, it says Part A coinsurance and the hospital costs uh, up to an additional 365 days after Medicare benefits are used up. So you can see as we read across the row, all of the plans will cover that 20% coinsurance. Uh, yeah, the coinsurance. Uh, so for um, the next row where it says Part B coinsurance, <clears throat> you can see that the first, well, the K and L plan don't cover that or they cover it at a reduced rate. If you look at um, uh, the Part A hospice care co-insurance and co-payment. Again, you can see which plans offer it and at how much. You can see skilled nursing facility care uh, co-insurance. And now you see we begin, as we kind of go down the chart, fewer uh, services are covered. So uh, for skilled nursing care, we see uh, plan C, D, F, G, M, and N will cover those uh, services and K and L will cover them at reduced rates. So part A deductible, remember that was the $1,408 per benefit period. <clears throat> so you can see again, which policies will cover those and the same with that part be deductible. And so the big difference between the F plan, the one that they're phasing out, and the G plan is <clears throat> that covering of the deductible uh, for Part B. If you look at the last row I have listed here, or sorry, the foreign travel, you can see which plans will cover if you're out of country. And then the last row uh, I, is, I think is really important too because we see that um, out-of-pocket limits and 
for most of the supplemental plans, it's not applicable, meaning there is no out-of-pocket limit. And I think that that's an important consideration too uh, when we talk about um, when we talk about healthcare in our senior years. Now, the K and L plans, they do have out-of-pocket limits. This changes, well, I shouldn't say that. The, um, the, the chart doesn't really, hasn't really changed except for that G and um, uh, F uh, shift that happened in 2019. Um, and then this other, this chart also doesn't typically change except for maybe those out-of-pocket limits for the K and L plan. So how do we use this, right? So let's say we decide uh, as a consumer, I think I may need a <clears throat> either a plan C or a plan G. When I go to compare plans then, um, I can uh, find the information for the plan C plans, for example, and then to be able to be able to compare across C plans, knowing for the most part, they are going to have the same um, coverage, right, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, um, the types of coverage uh, across those C plans. Now there may be differences in rates, there may be differences in the network, there may be differences in, um, in uh, some of the other benefits that are offered, but in terms of the basics, you'll be able to compare all the C plans uh, and, and be able to comparison shop. I think this is a great tool. It helps consumers to be more informed about the plan that they might wanna pick. So I guess I want to pause there for a second and ask, are there any questions? So if seniors are thinking about moving, they should consider their health care options coverage in their future area. Is that a true or false ask question? I think that would be true. Mm. <clears throat> I think that would be true. Now, they're, um, if they are choosing a Medicare original, right? Um, they pretty much are going to be able to go anywhere they want. It's that wraparound, that Medigap policy that they might have um, to some considerations to think about. Um, or if they're already enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, they'll have some considerations as well, because that oftentimes has a network. Good, and there's some discussion from others <clears throat> that are sharing in there, so. Oh, good. Yeah. We have some very informed people in our group today. And there's also uh, an online tool they have for Kansas and it's in the chat box as well. That's cool. And that looks like that's about all the questions there. Maria? All right. So we're on to the next set of questions. What documents provide information? Of course, if you know that, you can use your insurance wisely. <laughs> So, of course, there is the insurance card, right? Um, and so oftentimes uh, we will get a, um, well, you'll get a Medicare card once you enroll in Medicare. Uh, and thankfully they changed it up so you, <clears throat> your social security isn't on there and your social security number isn't on there anymore. Uh, uh, but it basically has this kind of information, your name and your, 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 um, your policy number, for lack of a better word, um, and when your coverage started. So some of the cost information, there's no cost information on, on here. So that's not a very helpful card when it comes to understanding costs. Um, but, you know, if you have a wraparound, a supplemental plan, or an advantage plan, uh, you're going to have more of a traditional um, insurance card. And so insurance cards, clearly, uh, you know, they're issued by the company and are going to have some very important information on it about uh, co-pays, uh, as an example, um, where to get more information, um, and, you know, 
kind of the effective dates and, and all those sorts of things. And so these are our proof of insurance um, and uh, they provide information uh, to getting addif additional information about our plans. Most plans, the, the Medigap plans, you're gonna get a new card every year um, um, as information changes. So again, this will be your Medigap plan and or your Medicare Advantage plan. And you can find those copayment amounts there. All right, where else can we find good information? Um, so the Medicare.gov website is an awesome website. It is um, very um, well written, I think, uh, pretty well organized. Uh, you can create um, a login so you can access your own information. You can uh, see sort of the information around the um, how you've used Medicare. You can see information uh, almost like an EOB of what's sort of been processed um, through Medicare. Um, <clears throat> When you are in the um, shopping side of trying to find a plan, uh, you can actually log in, put in your zip code, uh, put in uh, information about the kinds of prescriptions that you have, uh, and it will actually uh, uh, provide you, uh, kind of do a sort for you and provide you with information about um, supplemental plans as well as um, prescription drug plans. So it actually can help you on the comparison shopping side of things. Once you purchase a Medigap plan or a supplemental plan, there's oftentimes that evidence of coverage document that comes to you um, that provides more information about that supplemental plan. So these are two tools that um, are really important. Um, and oftentimes too, for Medicare, there is a document that's, oh gosh, almost three quarters of an inch thick called Medicare and you. And that is sort of the paper version of an evidence of coverage. Last, uh, first how question, right? How do I estimate my healthcare costs? And of course, once you do that, you're smart user of your insurance. And let's talk about some strategies for estimating costs. We are um, going to go through another case study. And so this is the third handout that I suggested that you pull up or print out. And so this is <clears throat> um, a case study similar to the costs case study that we went through last week, uh, yesterday set up much the same way in terms of their story with the costs and the use of the um, estimating um, healthcare costs uh, workbook. <clears throat> so today we are going to go through this with Terry and Drew who are a couple on the go and relatively healthy and they both have Medicare prescription drug and a type G supplemental medical slash Medica Medigap policy. After reviewing those healthcare expenses and the explanation of benefits documents from last year, Terry noticed that there's an um, individual deductible for part A of uh, 1408 and for part B of 198. Uh, and the type G plan covers the part A deductible, but not the part B deductible. So two times 198, that's, you know, uh, two, two deductibles for um, one for Terry and one for Drew is $100, uh, $396. And because the Met Medigap Supplemental G policy, um, the only additional out-of-pocket expenses will be for their co-payments for their medical costs. So each family member visited the primary care physician four times and they pay a $20 copay each time. And Terry determined that they had eight copayments. And Drew has allergies and visits the allergist once a year and has prescription drugs to help manage the allergy. And Drew pays $30 for the office visit and $15 for a 90 day prescription of four times a year. 
Terry and Drew both wear glasses and they go to the optometrist once a year for a checkup and each get new glasses. The vision co-payment is 30 and the glasses cost $300 each. Terry and Drew go to the dentist once a year with a co-payment of $30. <clears throat> So Terry spends about $290 uh, per month for the Medicare Part B premiums and $70 a month for prescription drug coverage and pays $380 a month for the supplemental G plan and $80 a month for dental insurance premiums for both of them. And they have an emergency fund uh, and Terry plans to set aside money for the full deductible and other out-of-pocket costs but also realizes that with Medicare and the supplemental insurance policies, there are uh, no out-of-pocket maximum, um, and so maximizing savings will be important. So here's our activity, much like yesterday. Let's begin to fill in that worksheet with the information. So when we do this in class, we spend some time actually uh, talking through and working through the numbers. I often put people in pairs and have them go through the case study and work on it together. And of course, this is the worksheet that we would be filling out. And I am going to kind of speed us through this so that um, you can see here it is filled out. Uh, and you can see uh, that there are a total fixed healthcare costs of $820. Uh, and uh, annual deductible of 396. And uh, we crunched in, put in the number of visits and the co-pays. And so there's flexible healthcare costs of about $970. So again, we turn to this um, boxes in the workbook to kind of figure out what do, what do I need to be saving over and above <clears throat> the premium for healthcare costs, as well as trying to figure out my total healthcare costs and uh, filled in. This is what this looks like. So <clears throat> uh, Terry and Drew need to be saving another $114 a month to help cover those out-of-pocket expenses, those flexible out-of-pocket expenses and the deductible. And all told, they are uh, spending about $11,206 per year for their insurance and other health care costs. So I know I buzzed through that, but that's because we did uh, what we did yesterday. So if there's questions about this case study, Maria, I think for confusion's sake, for those of us that aren't as familiar with Medicare as other people, I think we're providing misinformation to um, the people on our call because with part or with plan G, there are no co-pays in Kansas at least. So I don't know why we would be figuring that in for going to the doctor. So I mean, if you're on plan N maybe, but not plan G. The only thing you're gonna pay out of pocket there is $198 per person. Now, I mean, you could argue maybe eye exams maybe will or won't be paid, but there's a good chance they will be if it's coded correctly. So I don't know. I feel like we're overestimating what it's actually gonna cost. Okay, well, that's great. That's great feedback. Um, we can I mean, certainly- do you disagree <clears throat> with that? You know, one of the things that I find interesting is that there are some state differences. And so, um, so this might be one of those situations where there are state differences. All right. Well, I just don't want to confuse people the way it is. I mean, the majority of the people on the call are from Kansas. So I just don't want to give misinformation and then have them be confused in the future and then confuse their people more. So I just wanted to bring that up. So no big deal or just wanted to mention it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that's great. I really appreciate that. And, and clearly that's, we certainly don't want to create confusion <laughs> um, for our program participants. And so I think that that is something we can talk to about in terms of amending the uh, case study for you all so that what you are presenting is correct for Kansas. See what I'm saying? So yeah, you bet. Uh, you, I just want to make sure it was clear because mm -hmm, it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. 
yeah it's it's confusing enough as it is so absolutely let's let's make sure that what you guys are presenting is absolutely correct so thank you for that I appreciate it and hopefully um, that clears things up for your you and your colleagues there too well now you've seen this um, tool be used in a couple of ways um, and uh, it's there is a publication that is just uh, estimating uh, healthcare costs that um, is a great tool uh, whether you're doing something one-on-one -on -one with people uh, or doing something in a group setting um, and so the video yesterday where I played Aunt Maria we were using this same tool uh, to kind of do these calculations so there's a number of ways to use this tool uh, no matter what the I'll just say situation is or the case study so uh, four tips for managing your healthcare costs um, reviewing your health insurance documents so that you really understand your plan and the costs and really it's probably say understand your plans because most people are going to have more than one plan you want to try to estimate those co-payments and prescriptions and equipment and travel and you know all those costs that could be involved and try to calculate <clears throat> how much to set aside to cover those out-of-pocket costs and of course you want to shop, shop around uh, for your supplement and drug insurance plans each year um, what I've been finding is I've been watching this and you all probably know way better than I do um, that especially those prescription drug plans um, the formularies change uh, frequently and uh, and the premiums can be changing and so to shop around to be sure that you're getting what you need is really a key message for our program participants all right how do I cover long-term care this is a question that I often get in classes uh, and this is oftentimes what brings people to classes um, how do I cover this and, and what do I need to be doing so um, first a definition right what is long-term care and um, it's really a range of services and support for your personal care needs right and most long-term care isn't medical care instead that long-term care is help with basic personal tasks of everyday life and sometimes most of the time they're called activities of daily living also known as custodial care so these could be things like feeding oneself bathing oneself using the restroom um, you know keeping your home clean those kinds of those kinds of things and Medicare doesn't cover that type of care long-term care or just custodial care and I have found that this is a big um, surprise to many people <clears throat> so what does Medicare cover so it covers long-term care in a hospital right care in a long-term care type of hospital or in a skilled skilled nursing care in a skilled nursing uh, facility um, there are some el eligible home health services and we're seeing trends towards you know more um, medical uh, care happening within the home <clears throat> and then that hospice and respite care so those are the kinds of things Medicare does cover so what are some long-term care options um, <clears throat> so the Medicare and the Medigap or the supplemental health insurance policies are going to cover that skilled care uh, and then things like long-term care insurance um, you know would cover that custodial type of care and is usually based on that ability to perform those activities of daily living and typically um, cover a certain amount of uh, a dollar amount per day and so 
a long-term care insurance is much like a different, like a insurance policy where you're paying, right? And then once you need those services, you access that insurance policy to help cover those insurances, uh, those costs. Um, oftentimes purchasing a long-term care insurance when you're younger, um, uh, because it's cheaper, it is typically associated with how old you are, what the, the premium is. And so the, the younger you are when you start uh, long-term care, <clears throat> it typically costs uh, less. But the, the price does go up over time. So um, the older you are when you start long-term care insurance, um, you know, the higher the costs. And for many people, that's prohibitive. One of the, uh, the, the new, newer trends that is happening, maybe in the last five to seven years, is some life insurance policies have built in long-term care coverage. So how does that work? So it's actually a life insurance policy, usually a whole life or a universal uh, life policy where over time you have uh, accumulated uh, assets. Um, uh, and what this type of policy allows you to do is to draw on those assets. So as you age uh, and you need access to those assets, that, those ca that cash to help cover long-term care uh, costs, um, you can draw down uh, those assets that you have built up in that, in that life insurance policy. And what happens then, of course, is when you pass away, um, the policy is reduced by the amount of assets that you have already drawn. So um, the heirs then will, will only get sort of the balance of, that, um, of what's left in that policy in terms of the holdings of that policy. So I hope that that makes, that's a little clear, but for some people that is really um, a tool that is more accessible than a long-term care insurance policy. Obviously using one's assets can help cover the costs uh, of, of long-term care. And then, you know, once assets are uh, diminished to uh, a certain amount, then there are state and um, Medicaid programs that uh, might be available for those limited income um, uh, seniors that will help cover care. So those are some long-term care options. <clears throat> and um, this next slide really speaks to, you know, where to get more information, right? Um, and so the, the best, place to get Medicare information really is at medicare.gov um, and, and um, also the you know Medicare office or the the um, social security office depending on who houses that information in your state. Uh, the supplemental policy health insurance provider website um, or or uh, or 800 number meaning the, um, the, the policy, uh, the health insurance um, company who holds the policy, right? Uh, that would be a good place to get information about your Medigap or supplemental plan. The same thing for your Part D description plan, prescription drug plan um, provider, that health insurance company. Um, I have listed here the Senior Health Insurance Program, which uh, I know that in Kansas is called SHIC, right? And so that would be an excellent resource. Um, the local Medicaid office, and then there's also uh, this long-term care.gov uh, um, resource that provides some, some good resources about understanding that long-term care insurance uh, options. So this is the opportunity for you to ask uh, any questions that you might have. There were a couple comments and you may or may not have some insight on. Do you know if there is a resource research somewhere that would give us an average spent on dental and retirement or vision? 
Um, I haven't looked for one, but I'm wondering. I think people probably underestimate, but I also really question whether the premiums for dental or vision are worth it. I do not uh, have one off the top of my head. I think that's an excellent resource uh, question. And, uh, and I think we should investigate that so we have a little bit more data. Then we had, is the research showing that the number of people buying this type of insurance, and I think they're referring to long-term care insurance, trending down? I haven't seen latest statistics, but my sense is, um, yes, just from what I've read kind of in the, in the popular literature, you know, uh, and financial literature, um, is yes, just because it's become so um, expensive. So there's the short answer. You know, I, I was reading something the other day about, you know, do I, do I mortgage my house, right? Do I do a reverse mortgage or do I get long-term care <laughs> insurance, which really aren't comparable, but I guess if you're really in a need, in a, a place where you need it fast, um, people ask all sorts of crazy questions. And uh, some people were looking for a copy of the PowerPoint in box. I'm not sure what you put in box in regards to a version of this PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint is not in box. Um, I think I put notes box. Once you guys are, you know, officially certified educators, you will get access to the PowerPoint. And here is my contact information. If you would uh, like that, uh, like to connect with me, I'm happy to visit with you. So at this point, regarding that, the, whether it's in box folder or not, we do want to update to make sure that the information is relevant for your area. So, um, you know, like Maria said, we will get that information to you uh, as soon as the code of conduct and you'll get that, the full folder that'll have the PowerPoint in it, but we will, uh, you know, make sure that that reflects what, what you're dealing with out, out there in Kansas and the, the, the suggestions that Deb and Susie had both mentioned to us. Yeah, I think that we good. We can update that. 